Pal Duncan from Physics Education. You might have seen in the news lately that there's a lot of talk about something called coronavirus. So what is it? Where did it come from? And why is it a big deal? While we talk about coronavirus and maybe do some experiments of our own, keep two things in mind. First, that we at physics like to keep things lighthearted, but in doing this, of course, don't intend to make light of the situation. Second, that the situation is changing all the time and that it may be completely out of date and incorrect a week after it comes out. We just don't know. With both of those in mind, let's plough ahead. In December of last year, health officials noticed that there was a heap of pneumonia cases coming out of China, and that they were being caused by a virus that no one had seen before. This virus is a type of coronavirus. There's actually a lot of coronaviruses. If you're a young person listening to this, you might not remember, but us older folks would recall that back in 2003, there was an outbreak of something called SARS, which was also a coronavirus. Although if I remember correctly, no one really called it that at the time. Coronaviruses can also cause really simple illnesses like the common cold. They're called coronaviruses because if you look at them under a microscope, they look like a circle with all these spikes coming out of them, which makes them look like a crown. Crown in Latin is corona, therefore coronavirus. Anyway, Coronaviruses generally tend to cause respiratory illnesses. That is, illnesses that make you have a runny nose, a cough, sneezing, that sort of thing. This new one can be quite severe though, which means people have died. The virus appears to have originated in a seafood and animal market in Wuhan, China, which had a thousand stalls selling fish, chickens, pheasants, bats, marmots, venomous snakes, spotted deer, and other wild animals. This was a big clue that this virus is, and here's a fun word, zoonotic, which means it can spread between animals and humans. SARS was also zoonotic and came from a type of cat called a civet, while another coronavirus called MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, came from bats and camels. Other examples of zoonoses are bird flu, swine flu, and rabies, none of which are very much fun at all, to say the least. To stop the spread of this new coronavirus, China stopped people from travelling and isolated sick people and people who have been in contact with sick people. Because people who have become sick with the virus tend to have a fever, airports and train stations have put in place body temperature checks and asked people to declare if they feel unwell. But what is a virus? And how is it different from other disease-causing things, like bacteria? Let's start by talking about how living things work. All living things, like you, me, worms, this dog, are made up of cells. Cells are the tiniest bits of a living thing that can said to be alive, and you'd need a microscope to see them. Some living things are made of just one cell. Some of these, called eukaryotes, are big and complicated cells with something called a nucleus that holds all of its DNA. You are a eukaryote, meaning most of the cells that make up you are eukaryotic cells. Other types of cells, called prokaryotes, are much simpler and don't have a nucleus and some other structures inside them. Bacteria are this second type, prokaryotes. Bacteria are absolutely everywhere. They're in soil, water, plants, on your skin, in your gut helping to digest food. They're everywhere. Most are completely harmless to humans because our immune system can deal with them. But sometimes we can get bacterial infections, like strep throat, whooping cough, or tetanus. Viruses are different. Viruses are not made of cells, and we don't really think of them as being living things. The first virus was discovered by a Dutch botanist named Martinus Beyerink in 1898. Here's how I imagine that went down. Son of a tulip, I've discovered a virus. Viruses are really tiny, way smaller than bacteria. And even though they're technically not alive, they still have genetic material. You can think of viruses as like being tiny, tiny parasites that infect living things, like you, me, this dog, and even bacteria. Viruses cause all kinds of disease. 
The flu, measles, smallpox and cold sores all come from viruses. They can be transmitted from person to person a bunch of different ways. Through the air, where they survive in droplets released through coughing or sneezing, which people then breathe in. In droplets from coughing or sneezing that then wind up in people's eyes, nose or mouth. Gross. Fecal oral transmission, which means, yep, poop. This can happen if people don't wash their hands properly after going to the bathroom and then prepare food for others, or if water gets contaminated. Through direct contact, like touching or sharing a towel or clothes, or through a vector. A vector is an organism that doesn't have a disease, but that can carry and transmit it. For example, malaria is transmitted through mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are the vector. Viruses can also replicate, meaning they create more versions of themselves. To replicate, they need to get inside a living thing. That living thing then becomes a host. Depending on what type the virus is, it'll do one of two things to replicate. In the first, it will either attach itself onto a host cell and inject its genetic material or burrow its way into the cell. The genetic material basically contains instructions on how to make more of that virus. The host cell then just starts reading the instructions and starts making copies of that virus using its own tools or machinery. Eventually, as more and more of these copies are built, the host cell becomes so full it bursts like a balloon. This destroys the host cell and the virus copies can escape and start to cause mischief in other cells. This first type of replication we call the lytic cycle. It's like, imagine someone bursts into your room and tells you to build all this IKEA furniture, and eventually your room is so full of intelligently designed Scandinavian coffee tables that it explodes. It's just like that. The second type we call the lysogenic cycle. In the lysogenic cycle, the virus injects its genetic material into the genetic material of the host cell. So when that host cell wants to make more copies of itself, it also makes copies of the virus genes. And when those copies of the host cell make more copies of themselves, they make even more copies of the virus. Eventually, the host cells will be triggered into going into the lytic cycle, the first one we talked about, and suddenly millions of cells are exploding viral copies all at the same time. With the lysogenic cycle, Imagine you're reading Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, right? And your annoying friend puts an IKEA instruction booklet in there, without you noticing. Then two of your friends ask you to photocopy Harry Potter for them. Then their friends ask them to photocopy their copy of Harry Potter, and so on. Then all of a sudden, everyone's bedrooms explode with tastefully designed Scandinavian coffee tables. That's the lysogenic cycle. Most of the time, our immune systems find and attack these viral infections. So we get sick for a while, but then we get better. But there is a better way to fight viral infections, and that's to not get infected in the first place. Remember we talked about how viruses can spread? Through the air, droplets, poop, direct contact, or through vectors? Well, I wanted to conduct an experiment. If a virus got into the offices here at Physics, how well would it spread? Am I going to actually infect everyone here with the virus? Yes. No, I mean, no, I'm not. What I am going to do is design an experiment that investigates how well a virus in droplets could spread. So let's design our experiment. Imagine I sneeze into my hand and don't wash my hands. Now all the virus particles are in my hand. What am I going to do now? Touch things, probably. The virus will then spread onto the things I've touched. And when other people touch them, that virus can make its way into their bodies. We're going to simulate this using a special chemical that is invisible to the naked eye and perfectly safe, but that we can see under a UV lamp. I'll apply the chemical to my hand, and then when I touch things like a doorknob, it'll transfer onto that, just like droplets containing viruses would. When someone else touches that doorknob, they might pick up that imaginary virus and get infected too. If I shake someone's hand, it'll transfer directly onto their hand, and that also might infect them. So let's get started. I'll apply some to my hand, touch some things like doorknobs, and at the end of the day, we'll see how many people in the office also have traces of this chemical on their hands by using a UV lamp. If they do, they could be infected with our make-believe virus, and I'll have them building tastefully designed Scandinavian coffee tables in no time. Okay, so I'm here in the physics offices, and I have our special glow-in-the-dark chemical glow under UV light chemical and what I'm going to do is put it on one of the doorknobs here 
I can see now that it glows a lot under UV light, but uh, it just looks like a sort of whitish powder normally. So I'm going to pop that all over the doorknob here, and as people come through, she'll get on their hands, and then we can see how it spreads from there. Oh, I'm excited. Okay, placing it on the doorknob now. And let's do it on the second one, just for fun. Just a little bit. There we go, beautiful. All right, Captain's Log. Uh, I've just put it all over my hands and put it all over the doorknobs and then rinsed off my hand. And I noticed when I looked at the, um, looked at the, looked at my hand under the black light, stuff is still all over it. You can't see it on my hand at all, but it glows so much. So what that tells me is that if I just rinse, that's not going to get rid of this stuff off it. It would probably require a real good hand washing with soap. So just like real airborne virus particles, I would think. Very interesting. Later in the afternoon, it came time to reveal my cunning experiment to the staff. First up was Lisa, part of our delightful admin team. Ben, our CEO, was also in on the plan, so he wanted to see how it went. And as Lisa walked into the room, she went straight for a high five, meaning I could have infected her with my make-believe virus right there and then. It was here that we realised the experiment worked way better than I had thought it would. And it also started to create some problems. Stick around. So I've got, Lisa, I've got some terrible, terrible news that I need to share with you. Okay. Which is that I have been infected with a disease. It's called... Duncanosis. Oh, and it's carried by a virus called Fizzpox. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> and I would like to see if there's any likelihood that you are now carrying this virus as well. And the best way to do that is if I can please inspect your hands. Okay. Like this, please. Hands out like that. We're going to check with a UV, like a black light. <laughs> any? <gasps> Look at that. Look, can you see that? Yeah, can I can see, see that. See that little thing on your hand? Yeah. That is possibly a, a droplet that is carrying the virus. Fizzpox. I just high five you. Oh, know. no. Ben, you've got it too. Look at that. See that hand? All over it. All over it. That's bad news for you, my friend. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Making it worse. <laughs> there you go. I high fived you. What did you give me? <laughs> so I've been doing an experiment today. I've been doing an experiment, which is to basically see how easily a virus can be transmitted in a workplace such as this. And we have used a special chemical that looks like that. And I've been putting it all over the doorknobs, such as the one here and the one at uh, the office there. Mm -hmm. And everyone's been walking around and touching it, unknowing that uh, they could potentially be picking up a virus in a droplet. So you need to check your keyboards. Check your keyboards upstairs. Check your mug. Should we check your face? Oh, that's why I went like that. <laughs> yep. Really? Is that bad? <laughs> yep. Oh, no. You mean? <laughs> so, before you go, I'd like to ask you, what do you think What do you think are some good methods of preventing the, the transmission of this, of this virus particle? Washing my hands all the time. Yeah. Washing your hands. Would Frequently. Would you sanitizer get rid of this, though? Why don't we find out? Okay. Cool. We then moved to the bathroom so Lisa could test to see if the virus particles could be easily washed off, where she then looked in the mirror and discovered that because she had touched her face, it had spread there too. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Your eyes? Oh, my spots. Oh, it's all over my mouth! I, was just, I, I, I knew what was going on, so I did that. I was just curious to see. It's right? just a, it's a little bit, it's there. Especially around your mouth. Yeah, you know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear lord. Look at my hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. Mm. Close to that. Oh, so, goodness. Go. Yeah, straight on the mug as well. So we've gone from doorknob to your hands, your face, your mug, your face. It's even on my on phone. On your phone. It should be all over my phone as well, I reckon. Yep. Oh, it's just, oh, it's just it. Yep, it's all over. No, am I seeing dots? Am I just seeing no, things? No, it's there. The it's there. there. So if you give your phone to... Why am I holding this up to... <laughs> <laughs> it's the virus. Yeah. It's making me crazy. Yeah, actually, I just hold that on the left hand. So I'm holding the right hand, which has got all the 
fly yeah. jam stuff on it. So let's say someone came in here and they were carrying a virus no. and then you have now touched doorknobs and you've touched your face, you've touched your phone, yeah. later on you're going to go home and you're going to say you might give your kids your phone. Now they've got it as well. So it's really easy to spread these things. And how can we prevent it, Lisa? Washing hands. So why don't you try that now? We'll see how successful. The make-believe virus had made its way to Lisa's phone, Ben's face, all over the place. Sorry, Lisa. All right, give us a look at your hands. Let's see how successful you've been. It's a lot better. It's still there, though. You now have contagion. Yeah, you've got it forever. Sorry. <laughs> I think you need to do it. needs to be a very thorough scrub, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it seems that way. Well, we're That's learning more all the time, aren't we? This is fun. Well, the good news is uh, there is a cure for this disease. Mm-hmm. Do you know what it is? It's a hug. Oh, thanks. Yeah. But my fingers still so science. I know. <laughs> I then checked with all the remaining staff, six people in total, and all but one had visible virus particles on their hands. The one person who didn't has actually been sick with the flu recently, so she's been scrubbing her hands with hand sanitizer like mad, which looks to have done the trick. So is this a good experiment? Well, no. Our sample size how many people are included in this experiment, is only six people. To understand how a virus could spread, we'd need far more test subjects than that. And my method of spreading virus particles throughout the office was hardly scientific and quite random. We'd really want to test multiple different surfaces, doorknobs, keyboards, the microwave, multiple times to get a real understanding of the rate of transmission. But this is a make-believe virus after all. All for a bit of fun and to illustrate a point. When it comes to coronavirus, people are now worried that it will become what's called a pandemic. The World Health Organization defines a pandemic as the worldwide spread of a new disease. Should people panic, start living in silos and stockpiling canned food? Well, no. Just be sensible with your hygiene. Even then, the coronavirus is proving to be a lot less dangerous than SARS was. Most people experience symptoms similar to a cold. The best way to protect yourself from illnesses is with what the World Health Organization calls standard hygiene practices. Wash your hands frequently and thoroughly with soap or alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Follow good respiratory hygiene, which means cover your mouth and nose with your bent elbow or tissue when you cough or sneeze. Then dispose of the used tissue immediately. You should maintain at least a metre distance between yourself and anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Avoid touching your eyes, mouth, or nose. Hands touch many, many surfaces and can pick up viruses, like we've just discovered. Once contaminated, hands can transfer the virus to your eyes, nose, or mouth. And then they can get inside your body and make you sick. If you have a fever, cough, or difficulty breathing, seek medical care early and stay home if you feel unwell. That's been it for this episode of Physics Twist. I really hope that you enjoyed it and found it useful or informative. If you did, please leave a review on iTunes uh, or your podcast app of choice. And feel free to contact us with any questions or feedback. We'd especially like to hear from teachers or other educators. Until next time, stay soapy. Stay soapy.